let me tell you what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the future. Future that is not here yet and is only a figment of what the potential of this idea could be. And uh, as, as we talked um, and we listened to our radio, waves come in from an antenna somewhere, flow through the air, and are received by your radio. The radio is tuned to a certain frequency that picks up that broadcast. The question is, could we do this with electric power? Right now, electric power has a problem, okay? Anytime you want to connect your home to get electricity, uh, you have to put up a wire, all right? And these wires are all over the place, and, and uh, they're costly to maintain. Um, <coughs> that uh, if there's a snowstorm or a nice storm, all of a sudden you don't you lose your power. Um, when this is a blackout, as what happened in New York, uh, give you one example of that. There was a level three or four um, biological container on the island in, uh, near Long Island. And the doors were pneumatic, okay? And they were compressed air. Well, when the power failed, okay, uh, all these bugs were in this level four container, but uh, the power was gone. It was, the backup didn't work. And all of a sudden, the air was starting to leak out of the pneumatic door. And if, it hap if that power stayed off very long, everyone on Long Island would have been exposed to this deadly disease. So uh, that's what can happen if uh, the loss of power. And the other thing is aesthetics. What aesthetics really mean to us is going down the street and having a pleasant view of what's happening. And by getting rid of the wires, um, we can see that it's a great improvement. Now, we've done something about telephones, wires, okay? Um, right now, the biggest problem AT&T and the rest of them have is they got to maintain these wires that still connect up homes, home telephones, okay? But when that is eventually gone, the only thing remaining on here, uh, we're hoping that uh, television will also be wirelessly broadcast. We can get rid of the cable. And the last thing remaining is electric power. So what if we could, for example, have clothing that not only protected us and pro provided some uh, degree of modesty, but uh, could actually generate power that could charge your cell phone or could uh, provide you with heat uh, as you walk around or even cooling? What if your home the structure of your home, the skin of your home, would essentially uh, would absorb energy transmitted through the air, and in case of uh, a summer, could actually cool your home by re-radiating power back away from your home into space. What if we had a car where we had extremely uh, good, efficient so a transfer of power into the car skin or an inductive pickup in the road so that we could essentially not worry about fuel? What if we had buildings that not only generated electric power, but actually did something more? It was a billboard, it was a poster, it was a sign. Okay, well, it all goes back to Tesla. And Tesla was a genius uh, beyond his time. He was misunderstood in many cases. The man uh, invented AC, alternating current, okay? He was in fight, his original boss over here in this country uh, was um, Edison. And later Edison tried to steal his stuff and Tesla left him. Tesla had an idea about AC, alternating current. And he demonstrated these, uh, this alternating current with uh, two uh, walls there in that demonstration 
that are charged to, uh, that have alternating energy uh, fl flipping back and forth and creating an electric field. And that electric field allowed him to take a, a bulb, a tube that was sealed to both ends and partially evacuated and make it glow. Well, his idea was eventually that provide power to the people by radiating electricity, uh, AC electricity through the air and uh, having spaceships and planes pick up that energy and have it broadcast across the cities and uh, power uh, that would be essentially limitless. Now, uh, you notice on the right hand side that building. Well, uh, that's Wardenclyffe, which is located in Long Island. It was uh, an idea that uh, J.P. Morgan invested in. He invested $150,000, which in today's dollars may be worth $10 million. Uh, and it was designed by uh, architect Stanford White, who is probably one of the world's greatest architects. Um, and Tesla decided he was going to build a laboratory in that building and also this gigantic ball at the top, which would be charged to very high voltages, but be radiating this alternating frequency. And it started in uh, 1901, the construction of this tower, and was abandoned in 1905, because uh, as the story goes, J.P. Morgan finally realized, wait a minute, if they broadcast this power from this unit, anybody can use it and it's all free. Wait a minute, I'm a financier, I'm, I'm here to make money. So it was abandoned. And uh, Marconi, Mar I'm sorry, Tesla had a lot of patents, but they were running out, so he was running out of money. So the end result was that they, this was abandoned, but he did build a tower 200 feet high with a three foot ball on the top that was charged to 100 million volts, okay? And it was built in Colorado. And uh, they had special antennas which looked like barbed wire strung along the grounds uh, in uh, ranches in the Colorado area. Well, the, the problem that Tesla had, and the reason it didn't work that well, was the fact that the wavelength, the, t the length of the antenna would have to be 21 kilometers because he couldn't go to very high frequencies. So we go back to one thing. We have the sun. The sun has enough energy that, that is radiated, reaches Earth. Half the sun energy that hits the outer atmosphere of Earth is reflected back. The other half hits the ground, okay? and. Take this piece of paper, eight and a half by 11. Do you know how much power is uh, generated by the sun that hits this, this piece of paper midday on a, sun, on a summer day? 60 watts, 60 watts. And now if we could convert that 60 watts of sun power very efficiently to electric power, then indeed we would have a power source. The problem was that uh, the frequencies are so s uh, large, uh, small rather, the wavelengths are so small that the antennas would be miniature. Uh, and um, the Earth itself is absorbing a certain amount of power. And what happens is, this is very interesting, um, the sun has a temperature about 6,000 degrees centigrade, okay? Hits the Earth and the Earth re-radiates at night about 15 degrees. So the idea is if you could capture your energy and in the sun area and uh, convert it and re-radiate it at uh, that five to 10 microns, this region here, you could broadcast that power <laughs> into space and cool your house, okay? So how do you do that? Well, it's done by what is called a rectenna. Now that term came from a guy fr who headed up Raytheon, and we're gonna talk about him in a minute, uh, but the antenna, a diode, it takes the AC that's connected to the antenna, that's picked up by the antenna, 
it rectifies it and turns it into alternating DC. The energy is then captured by the capacitor, okay? So that's a definition of the rectenna. A uh, guy named William Brown um, was the chief scientist at Raytheon Laboratories up in the uh, Boston area. And he thought, well, gee, if I could go and put a big microwave source in space and power it with the sun, I could radiate microwaves down to the earth and we'd have all, all sorts of power that, that we could use. The problem was that um, in those days, uh, microwaves were just coming in, but uh, his big problem was trying to couple the source to the uh, receiving antenna. And it took him years. Uh, this 1964 picture was taken at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. I worked there at that time and witnessed this demonstration. Uh, he had a helicopter tethered, and the power from a microwave tube was broadcast and received by the antenna that allowed the helicopter to fly. Now, um, later on, he, they actually got to the point where they could make this other airplane here in Canada uh, fly um, without any fuel. Essentially, the, the power was broadcast up and uh, allowed the plane to fly. Now, uh, well, when we got down to today's time, and we're trying to couple the sun's energy. We know the wavelengths are extremely small, and so we have to build antennas that are a fraction size of your human hair. And the antennas, here's an antenna for example, uh, will be backed by a diode and a capacitor. The antennas themselves are being done at uh, Idaho National Laboratories, and the concept is it would pick up either infrared or eventually visible wavelengths with a series of foils, okay? The nano, that uh, piece of golden foil probably has millions, millions of antennas on it, all right? And tuned to one frequency. Well, we want to go over a broader wavelength of, of frequencies, so we add more foils one layer at a time, okay? And, but there are some problems associated with that. One is the diode is not, has not been invented that works at very, that terahertz region. And so that's one of the problems. But uh, the coupling could be as good as 80% or better so that the conversion efficiencies of this future type of energy receiver from the sun could be in the 80% efficient region. Okay, the so working on solar energy as we do, right now our efficiency is in the order of 20%, and we might see 30% in five years. So this is beyond our normal look at uh, today's technology, but going beyond, leaping over today's technology, and going one generation beyond. Um, the, it needs a lot of work. There's a laying of different frequencies, a matching, fast diodes, nanocapacitors, and so forth. This is all technology issues. It does not vi violate any laws of physics, and therefore, it can be done. City of the future, here's what it could look like. No wires. Everything is wireless. Our, our, our uh, communication's wireless, our uh, power is wireless, and no matter where you go, you'll have access to electricity. So this is what we see envisioned maybe at the turn of the next century. Thank you.